seats. That would be great. As required by the Ontario Marriage Act for the publication of bans, we are pleased to announce the wedding of Sam Kim and Teresa Kim on July 16th. Any known reason why this marriage should not happen should be reported to our church leadership. Please pray for this couple as they prepare to unite as husband and wife. For those that don't understand what just happened right now, uh, this is called the public bans of marriage. It is required by me as a minister of the go uh, government of Ontario or of a religious organization in the government of Ontario to publish that ban in order to marry them. So please pray for them. Also, uh, this, not today, but the following Sunday, there is going to be a special membership meeting. For those that, that can attend, it will be at 1 p.m. It will be on Zoom. Please uh, attend that meeting. We're going to talk about the auditor's report. I believe that has to get passed. And there is a, another uh, topic uh, on that agenda as well. If you'd like to know more, you can talk to any of the deacons, uh, like uh, Nelson, uh, John, and Chester, or even myself. Today, we're going to have, as well, the Spanish congregation is going to join us for worship today. So it's going to be full, and uh, welcome them afterwards. We also have a special presentation by a missionary uh, I cannot say that person's name while uh, we're recording on the web, but uh, we encourage you to talk to that person as well after service and, and learn more about the mission field. I'm going to begin our time with a prayer. Father in heaven, you are the one who gathers your people. We hear your call. And Lord, we answer, great shepherd. Holy God, now teach us what it means to accord with sound doctrine. Give us insight so that we can comprehend your truth. Instruct us in the ways of godliness. Then enable us to live godly lives. We want to know you. Tell us who you are. We want to please you. How can we do that? We want to be sound in doctrine and sound in speech. Sharpen our minds and open our hearts. Make us keen to observe and be attentive to your word. And may we be sound in faith, love, and steadfastness. To the glory of God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I invite you now to stand if you're able and let us sing praises to our God. Hi. 
unto the grave unto the grave what will we sing christ he lives christ he lives and what reward will heaven bring An everlasting life with him there we will rise to meet the lord then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when christ is ours forevermore oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess christ the hope in life and death oh sing Hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh the fullness of God in helpless pain this gift of love righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross has jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied Forever sin on him was laid. here in the death of christ i live There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost his grip on me. the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme. 
scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand you may be seated children i'm gonna ask you guys to stay put we're going to have a children's sermon in a minute, but I'm going to actually ask someone to come up and give a presentation. Uh, now, before that person does that, I have to let the online people know that, unfortunately, we cannot broadcast this portion of the service due to security concerns. We're gonna, uh, there's some uh, information that's going to be divulged that cannot be put on YouTube. Uh, to protect the people in the country that this person has worked with. And this person also, we want to make sure that they have uh, an ability to enter into that country as well in the future. So I'm going to ask our AV team to go ahead and black out the audio and the video.
around, I think. Uh, and so she also has some, I don't know if you have any more of these, but uh, we can definitely order them. So this is uh, six ways to be involved in missions. If you're curious about, uh, oh, maybe, maybe you're like, I, you know, I have a job here, my family's here, I don't know how to be involved in missions. Well, actually, you can. You can be involved in many different ways, specifically six ways. And so I encourage you to pick this up. And if you want a copy, we can definitely order some for you, okay? Children, I'm going to ask you guys to come up, and we're going to start the children's sermon. Now, some of you Spanish uh, congregational children, you guys can come up too. But basically what we're doing here is we're just going to, I'm just going to give a word to the kids that correspond with the adult sermon. It's not very long, but I have a question for you guys, okay? Can you name a disciple? I'm going to put that name here. Yes. John. John. Okay, okay. John. Any other disciples that you know? Yeah? Matthew, Matthew, just ignore my bad handwriting. What else? Do you know another? Yeah? David? David was from where? What, who is David in the, in the Bible? You don't know? King David are you talking about? David? Okay. I'm going to put David here. Not because you're entirely wrong. I'm going to save that, okay? But in terms of the 12 disciples, was he, maybe he wasn't one, right? Okay. Peter. Okay. Anybody else? There's quite a few, right? It, it's, it's hard to remember all of them, right? Who, who knows all 12 disciples? Who knows? Who knows at least one disciple? So some of you know at least one. You guys should actually know at least three, Okay. So you just have to read it, and you have three disciples right there. Is that right? Yeah? Do you have another one, Andre? Uncle. uncle. Okay, I'm going to put uncle here. <laughs> and the reason why I'm putting the, the, the other names that aren't the 12 disciples here, it, it's for a reason, right? Because when we think of disciple, we're thinking of Jesus' 12 disciples, like, I don't know, Peter, Andrew, James, John. Does that sound familiar? Philip. Bartholomew, that's an interesting name, isn't it? Thomas, Matthew, James, Thaddeus, uh, Simon, and Judas. Judah, uh, Judas. But there are other disciples around us. There are disciples like David. Is there a David here? There's at least one that I know of. Yeah. Is David a disciple of Jesus Christ? No. <laughs> David, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Theoretically, that's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> the answer is yes, David is a disciple. Or who's an uncle here? Any uncles? Uncles? Come on, yeah, there's a few uncles here, right? Are these uncles disciples of Jesus Christ? The answer is yes. The answer is yes, right? Uncles, some uncles, not all uncles, but some uncles are disciples of Jesus Christ. Are you a disciple? Am I di a disciple? Yeah. If, okay, look, if your parents are disciples, then what do they do? Or if you're a disciple, what do you do? Or if I'm a disciple, what do I do? What do I do? I said it. We do what as a disciple? No, we don't swim. <laughs> We follow Jesus Christ. Actually, disciple, it's, uh, part of that word means student. You, and a student follows what the teacher says, right? Right? Do you guys follow what the teacher says? Yeah? Who doesn't follow what the teacher says? <laughs> That's good. It's good that you follow what the teacher says. And so when you think about that, you have a picture of following Jesus Christ. Right? So with that definition in mind... Let's name some other disciples. Who else is the disciple? Yeah. What? Thomas. 
Thomas, that's one of the 12. Do you know a Thomas that isn't part of the 12? No? What other names? If, if it's not just the 12 disciples, who else is a disciple? Name somebody. Do you know anyone? Are your parents a disciple? Are you, yeah? What? Nelson? Somebody said Nelson? <laughs> Questionable, but I'm just kidding. What else? Andre, Andre, do you know somebody else that could be a disciple? Huh? Victor? I don't know who that is, but maybe there is a Victor who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. Do you see what I mean? We could put, like, a, we could fill this board with names because God, God saves so many people. And we should be encouraged that because, by that because Jesus saves you too. We know someone is a disciple when their love of God is on display. So let's follow Christ together. Let's be students together, okay? We'll, we'll encourage each other to be students and followers of Jesus Christ. So let's pray for that to happen. Father, I want to thank you for the fact that we can be disciples through Jesus Christ. Now help us to live a life that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. For those that don't know, we do have a Sunday school program, and they can follow Carmen, who is uh, with the blue mask, walking down the aisle, and you're welcome to send your kids with her. You're also welcome to keep your kids here and enjoy the worship service uh, with us. So we don't, we're not opposed to children being here during the adult sermon. All right, we're back in Titus. We took a, a, a brief break to uh, go through Nehemiah. I think it was Nehemiah 10. And the point of that sermon was to encourage us to build the church, which is you, together. But we're back in Titus, and we're still in the, uh, the first kind of part, but the second chapter. And so I just want to review a little bit the first chapter of Titus for those that are helicoptering into this sermon series. So basically, Titus 1, verses 5 to 9, is simply, if I could summarize it, it's about godly leaders. And then after that, in verses 10 to 16, the, that part of the letter is about ungodly leaders. So pretty easy to remember, remember right? Godly leaders and ungodly leaders. And that's what Paul has to say about that. Now, as we head into chapter 2, Paul's focus is no longer on the church leadership. His focus shifts to everyone in the church. So that looks like you, all of us here today sitting, right? So that's his focus. Now, I have repeatedly said, if you recall, that the overarching theme of the whole letter warns us about two things. Number one. It warns us about influencers and warns us about influences. Specifically, Paul wants us to be surrounded by good, godly influencers and good, godly influences. Pretty clear. Now, this is important to keep in mind as we consider the church as a whole because you and I, we don't live here in this building. We don't have cots lined up here and, you know, you don't have beds and blankets and you're stuffy. If you have stuffies, that's weird as an adult to have that. But anyways, we don't live here in this church. We're going to go out there. We're going to interact with people. We're going to influence and be influ influenced by them. So our godliness, it doesn't manifest separately. We're, we're kind of like water molecules. We're water molecules in the same pond. If a rock is thrown in, we're all carried along the waves together. But if, if the pond is undisturbed, we actually experience peace together. We affect one another. In this room, we, with each other, if one of you rejoices, happiness abounds. Or if one of you is sad, we are there to share in that sorrow. If one of us is struggling, we're there to help. If one of us sins, we all feel the weight of that sin. 
This is why it's important to watch how we keep in step with one another. So let us not be thoughtless about our speech or reckless about our actions. Let us be wise. Let us consider how to influence one another to the glory of God. And to that end, we're going to read Titus 2, verses 1 to 8. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and, to, and so train the young women to love their husband husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. This is the word of the Lord. Now, this passage is about discipleship. The word disciple, or discipleship specifically rather, it isn't found in the Bible. But that doesn't mean it isn't biblical. Actually, the word discipleship might not be found in the Bible, but the word disciple, which is part of that word, that word is found in the Bible, and it, the Greek equivalent is mathetes. So a, di- a disciple in a Christian context simply means this, follower of Jesus Christ. And if we, uh, and as the children's sermon indicated, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you're going to follow him. So you're automatically a disciple. And if we don't follow Christ, uh, in the way that we ought, we're, we're basically cocoon- cocooning ourselves from other people. We're sheltering ourselves from other people. Disciples, they follow Christ not in isolation by themselves. We follow Christ with others. In Matthew 28, 18 to 19, it says this, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Jesus doesn't say, Go therefore... And segregate yourself from all nations. He tells us to make disciples by going to them. Being in community. Discipleship is about involving yourself with others. You follow Christ by helping others also follow Christ. So to put it another way, discipleship is a community project. But it starts with something called sound doctrine. Verse 1 says this, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now doctrine, it's simply translated, or a synonym of it is teaching or instruction. And on the basis of that definition, everyone, everyone is indoctrinated by some form of doctrine. Unless, unless you completely shut off your brain there is, there's actually no way to escape indoctrination. Everything you know, every, every idea you have, if, if you've read it somewhere or watched it somewhere, that's some form of indoctrination. What I'm trying to get at is this. Don't jump to the conclusion that doctrine is a bad word. If, you've, if you feel anxious about that, doctrine, it, it gets a bad rap, but it's not a word that we should be terribly concerned about It's the content that that word points to. That's what matters. You see, in April 2020, medical masks were in short supply in the U.S. and Canada. You might remember that time. And around this time, in the U.S., the U.S. Surgeon General, and I'll I'll say his name, Jerome Adams, he announced, it's now deleted, the tweet, but... It, it was copied and people know about it. He tweeted, seriously, people, stop buying masks. They are not effective in preventing general public from catching coronavirus. Now, a few days later, 
the U.S. official explained, he said, they said this, the public health community were concerned that it, it was at a time when personal protective equip, equipment, including the N95 masks and the surgical masks, were in very short supply. They said that, in other words, or that Surgeon General said that because, not because they were actually effective, or ineffective rather, but because they didn't have enough stock. In other words, the U.S. officials promoted a lie to conserve masks for healthcare workers. Now, I'm not here for, I'm not telling you the story to judge them. I'm just trying to illustrate how there's indoctrination happening all the time. And specifically, in that case, the Surgeon General taught the public to think a certain way about masks. But it didn't end up being true. So due to the content of that doctrine, it resulted in a num number of people getting sick. So again, we're not judging that. We're just saying, be careful of the information that is indoctrinating you. Now, this is why we need additional word and an additional word to help us evaluate our doctrine. Simply, simply hearing something and then applying it, that's not enough. We need, in addition to doctrine, we need the word sound. Sound doctrine. Now you might hear the word sound and you might be like, oh yeah, audio signals. That's, that's what sound is. Well, in our English dictionaries, it, could, it doesn't just refer to audio signals. It refers to being in good condition or competent or reliable. The word sound, it actually keeps coming up in our passage. Verse 1, it says, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Or verse 2, older men are to be sound in faith. Or verse 7, show yourself self in all respects to be sound in speech. The word sound, it comes from this Greek word that means to be free. Uh, sorry, to be in a state of wellness or health. Or to be free of infirmity or disease. Our English words, uh, hygiene, actually find their etymological roots in this Greek word, specifically in uh, a variation of the word hugienos. And so you can kind of hear the, the similarity between the, the two words. Now my family, we like to go on nature walks together. And every time we go, we go equipped. I, I bring my, well, I, I've changed it up. I, I used to have a fanny pack, but now, now I have a backpack. Who's laughing? Somebody laughed. I heard a laugh. Fa fanny packs are fine now, I think. Everyone has them. Anyways, so my children, they have fanny packs too. And it's stuffed with survival gear and bags. We have bags stuffed with water bottles and snacks. My wife, she also equips with her on her phone this particular app. And that app, it accesses the phone's camera. And you can take a picture of various plants and trees. And it will identify what that tree is or that plant. Well, on one trail, when we went to New Newmarket, we noticed a plant that lined the whole path. It was pretty propagated everywhere. And my wife, she used that app on her phone and found out that that plant is called milkweed. Milkweed. Milkweeds are tall with oval-shaped leaves, and they, those leaves taper to a point. So if you ever look for that, that's what it kind of looks like. Anyways, we learned that milkweeds are the only plants on which monarch butterflies lay their eggs. There is no other plant that monarch butterflies lay their eggs. Only milkweed. And this is because when the eggs hatch, the monarch larvae need to eat and it only can sustain its diet on milkweed leaves. It's, it's strange how only one plant can sustain monarch butterflies. If their legs, eggs, if their eggs were laid on any other plant, they would die. Now notice that Paul doesn't write, teach what accords with true doctrine. Is what we would kind of expect him to say there, right? But instead he writes, teach what accords with sound or healthy doctrine. You see, a monarch butterfly could potentially lay its eggs on any leaf. You can even imagine a scenario where that happens. You, you're a monarch butterfly friend, and you see your 
your friend, you know, flying around, can't find milkweed leaves. And so they, you notice that they get tired of, of searching for that leaf. And in the midst of its exhaustion, it, it, you, I'm just imagining this. You imagine that that butterfly says, oh, this leaf is good enough. I think it's, it's like any other leaf. And it lays its eggs on that leaf. And you know that it's going to be wasted. Those eggs are wasted because there is a big difference between a true leaf and a sound leaf. All leaves are true, but only some leaves are sound. Only one leaf for the monarch butterfly is sound. Is, it will lead to good health. Do you see what I mean by that? This is why we need sound doctrine in addition to true doctrine. We need doctrine that gives not just us information that's true, but, but life. We need sound doctrine that gives us life instead of death. So what is sound doctrine? In Titus 2.10, Paul calls it the doctrine of God our Savior. Then he unpacks what this means in verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God, great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Sound doctrine, in other words, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we know what sound doctrine is. If we know what sound doctrine is, we can disciple others in sound doctrine. We, we can talk to them about, about the gospel of Jesus. We can apply grace in every circumstance, in every word. And, and so obviously this, re this requires some information transmission. So we're not saying there's no information transmission. There is. Verses 7 to 8 hints at this. In your teaching, in your information transmission, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech. Now sound speech here, it can be translated right words or accurate information. You see, we don't teach wrong things about God our Savior. We teach correct things about God our Savior. So true doctrine, still true doctrine, but it has to be sound. 2 Corinthians 4.2 says, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. It is true, in other words. And by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So, discipleship is about information transmission or accurate information. This involves putting into words what the gospel is. So, if you don't know how to do that, you should practice that. Write it down. You know, actually, uh, in, when we used to train missionaries for church and missions, uh, we, we used to get them to do that. Give, write down in five minutes what the gospel is and what it means to you. And we found out that a number of people couldn't actually put into words very well. They kept on asking questions, very difficult. For some reason, at least that generation of mission, missionaries didn't understand how to communicate the gospel. Actually, in verse 1, we learn, uh, it, it says one thing, but it can be literally translated, say or speak, but accords with sound doctrine. So... It, it, it is teaching, but it's, it's also saying, speaking, what accords with sound doctrine. In other words, Paul doesn't start off this section of letter with an exhortation to teach. He wants you and I to have in view the manner in which we speak as well, or how we speak. So it's about talking, uh, uh, speaking, but it's also the way you speak. So you can ask yourself some questions at this point. Does the manner in which I, we speak as well as the content of what we speak, does it accord with sound doctrine? Or to put it another way, how do we speak in such a way that accords with sound doctrine? It's not about just the content, but also the way in which we say it. If you're talking about the gospel in a begrudging, un, uh, a negative way, obviously people aren't going aren't gonna to be like, oh, that's awesome. You see, brothers and sisters, how does your life of faith Affirm your profession of faith. So we, we not only say and 
say it in a way that glorifies God, but we also live in a way that confirms what we say. Does that, does that make sense? We are called to model sound doctrine. Now, if you're confused as to how to model, so the exhortation is to, to say sound doctrine or say the gospel and, and say it well, but also to model a life that doesn't negate what you, what you say. Well, if you don't know how to do that, to model that sound doctrine, all you have to do is read the rest of our passage. In fact, we're just going to go quickly through it to get an idea of how to model sound doctrine. To say it, but to model it, model it as well. So, the first thing that Paul does is he addresses older men. Who considers himself an old man here, just out of curiosity? One person, two, three, three people. And, and the two people that raise their hand is older than the uh, third person, I think, right? So, older men, this is a message to you. Listen carefully. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Here Paul lists for you older men, and some of you who didn't raise your hand but should be considered in this category, right? He lists four characteristics that describe an older man who accords with sound doctrine. Sober-minded. This is a man who loves to be clear-headed. He's not given over to extremes in behavior, all angry or terribly grieving and sad. Nor does he let, let his addictions rule over him. The second thing is that he's supposed to be dignified. This is a man who is honored for his moral integrity. He's respected for his goodness. Thirdly, he's, he's to be self-controlled. Sober-mindedness is about the mind. So we, that's one requirement. This part... Uh, the idea of being self-controlled is about the heart. A self-controlled person is not only able to think clearly, they are able to keep control of their own passions and desires. And then finally, he's to be sound in faith, love, and steadfastness. So those three, faith, love, and steadfastness, be sound in that. Remember, the word sound, it, 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 it's used in terms of how one, your, one is aligned to the doctrine of God our Savior in verse 10. So this doctrine is, is essentially about being God-centered. So this is a man who trusts God, who loves God, and then he keeps on trusting and loving God. That's what it means to be steadfast. So older men, you must live according to the sound doctrine by living as models for us to follow. Next he addresses older women. Okay, who consider, this is, this is going to be very controversial. After. I, I know someone's going to talk to me about this. But who considers this, themselves an older woman? You don't have to raise your hand. But you can think it, okay? I am an older woman. This, is word, this word is for you. Listen carefully. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior. Not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. There's three characteristics that older women are to follow. And to accord with in terms of sound doctrine, they must first be reverent in behavior. These words would have evoked actually images for the, the people reading that letter. They would have thought about the priestesses in temples, in, their, in those pagan temples that were around them during that time. You see, priestesses, they would never desecrate their worship with idolatry and sensuality. It's a holy place. And indeed, this is not a characteristic that's just limited to older women. We're all priests by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're all called to be reverent. 1 Peter 2.5 says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So that being said, even though we're all called to be priests to, to a degree, older women are specially encouraged by Paul to consider how to be reverent in behavior. Older women must also refrain from slandering. The Greek word here is diabolos. Sounds like diablo, like devil. Actually, the root word is sometimes used for the devil. But it also refers to a devilish person. Paul uses this word to describe a slanderous or adversarial person. This is a person who gossips and slanders people and belittles someone else, whether in public or private. This does not befit a woman of God. And then lastly, older women are not to be slaves of their addictions. In Paul's day, some, some women, 
were slaves to their wine. In our day, I think there's an equivalent. It's not wine. Or it could be wine. But I think it's more social media nowadays. Right? Maybe you're scrolling that feed, whatever it is, or watching too much Netflix. You're obsessed with it. You're addicted to it. Either, either way, they, these habits do not befit a woman of God. Now, we should mention that Paul encourages older women to develop the skill of teaching what is good. And that's not a character qualification. It's, it's just good communication. Grow in good communication, older women. Grow in communicating sound doctrine so that younger women would be better because of it. So let's turn to verses 4 to 5 now, okay? Paul teaches, uh, uh, he continues to address older women, but younger women, if you consider yourself a younger woman... You can benefit by eavesdropping on this conversation because this applies to you. Verses 4 to 5. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to your own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. I should, I should mention here that in Paul's day, women were often married at a very, very early age. So this doesn't mean that you single ladies, it doesn't apply to you. It's just that Paul is assuming that most women in their adulthood are married at the time. So we just have to adjust that thinking in our context. Now let's go through them. These are characteristics that describe a younger woman who accords with sound doctrine. First, they love, love their families. And if they're married, fitting our cultural context, you're encouraged to love your husbands and children. You're also self-controlled. We already went through that. Uh, you're supposed to be pure. The word here is agnos, which means holy. When, when it's used, this word is used of a woman, it often carries the meaning of chasteness or purity. In those days, uh, women, young women, they braided their hairs uh, and go with gold and pearls and costly attire. They were a symbol of pretensions, pre pretension rather. So you, you wore these things to, to show off your style, to flaunt who you are. But someone who professes godliness does everything they can, not to divert attention to themselves, but to God. That's what a godly woman does. That's what it means to be truly pure. Now, young women are also uh, to be working at home. And that seems, whoa, that's a little bit controversial there. But actually what, what he means is hard workers at home. This doesn't mean that they can't be home, home they, like you, all you have to be homemakers. That would mean that almost every woman here uh, is, is sinning, right? No, that's not what it means. See, Proverbs 31 commends a woman who has a job outside their home. So Paul, he's, he's not rebuking women who are working outside of the home. No, that's not the case. He's rebuking lazy women. Women who avoid doing chores. Women who neglect their families. I don't think that's anyone here. I think, but there might be. And if you profess godliness, that's sin. And then lastly, or second to last, is young women must be kind, not spiteful. And then lastly, they must be submissive. Now, we've talked about this elsewhere, but in our modern context, that sounds so abrasive. But a biblical understanding of submission has nothing to do with the oppression of women. It's just about displaying God's submission, like Jesus' submission to the Father. We're, we're displaying that same thing. So women, you do that too. Now Paul ends his instruction to women uh, with this. Do these things so that God is not reviled. The word reviled, it, it also means to blaspheme. Uh, in fact, it could be translated that way. A blaspheming person says to God, you're not worthy of my worship. Now Paul's warning is a helpful reminder his, his instructions, they're not just these frivolous rules to, to mindlessly abide by. This is, how, this is how you and I can worship God. This is how we honor God. Now, the last group he addresses is younger men in verse 6. And it's very, very short. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Uh, so concise. I love that. But uh, So here, here's why I think that he kept it brief. I think for a younger men, there would have been too many things to list, you know, <laughs> too many things that younger men are prone to, and that list would have been like another letter. It's because younger men, 
has so many shortcomings. It would take a 500-page letter to address all the issues that men have. And I know this from experience. So he just says, be self-controlled. Because that's the hardest thing for a young man. Consider that. Now the question now is, I know I asked you guys, oh, do you consider yourself an older man or younger, uh, younger man or older woman or younger woman? But you still have to ask that question of yourself. Because everybody here fits one of those categories. Every single person. The question that remains is, who are you? Are you a young man, older man, young woman, or older woman? And it depends, right? It depends out on how old you are. Is that how it depends? No. Actually, it depends not on the age of the people around you or your own age. It's, about your, it's not about your physical age is what I'm saying. It's about your spiritual age. Like, who are you in the spirit? How is your, if you were to evaluate yourself, what it, uh, what, where are you at in terms of your spiritual maturity? What is spiritual maturity? What is it? What is it? Well, let me explain through a, a story. There was once a young man, and he was eager to grow in his Christian life. So he got a piece of paper, and he made a list of all the things he would do for God. He wrote down all the things he planned to give up. Like, I'm going to give up smoking, and I'm going to give up uh, my video games. I'm going to give up all these things. And he wrote down all the names of the places he would go to share the gospel. I'm going to go to this country and share the gospel. I'm going to go to this neighborhood and share the, share, share the gospel. And so he wrote that list, and he completed the list, and he took it to the church. And then as a symbol of his love and devotion, he took that list and placed it at the altar. And upon doing that, he thought, I'm going to feel so much joy. But instead, he felt empty. So he took the list home and, and thought, oh, and you know what? Maybe I need to add more to the list. Maybe God is not pleased with me, so I need to do more. So he committed himself to doing more for God and less for himself. He put all manner of parameters on his life in the hope that God would be pleased. And once again, he went to the church and he laid that list on the altar. And again, he felt nothing. Confused? He approached this wise, seemingly wise, older pastor and asked him for counsel. He's like, he's like what, what is going on? How come I don't feel joy? How come I feel nothing when I give this list to God? And the pastor said, why don't you do this instead? Why don't you put that list away and get a blank sheet of paper, sign your name at the bottom, and then put that on the altar? And when this young man did that, he realized what that pastor was teaching him. And peace came into his heart. Brothers and sisters, if you're wondering where you're at in the spirituality scale, the spiritual maturity scale, know that spiritual, spiritual maturity is this. It is knowing and believing. It is knowing and believing. That there is nothing that you can do to add to what Christ has done for you. It is knowing and believing that you cannot do anything to earn what Christ has done for you in order to bring you to God. You do nothing. In fact, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the formula. That's what it means to be spiritually mature. It means going to God and saying to him, not these are the things I'm going to do for you, but do what you will. I am yours. Spiritual maturity is this. It is evidence when there's this desire for God in every corner of your life, every area of your life, and saying, yours. That's sound doctrine. Now, from that, from that spiritual maturity, go and make disciples. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we are tempted 
to make a list and do all these things. But it is out of the joy that we have in Christ that you have called us to be disciples and to make disciples. So Lord, I pray that wherever we classify ourselves in this scale of spiritual maturity and try to understand whether we're older or younger, God, I pray that you would impress upon our hearts this idea that we are supposed to trust you in all things and so shape our character. Be the one that gives the growth. Be the one that encourages our heart to not be proud in what we have done and accomplished, but rather in what Christ has accomplished for us. And Lord, I, I pray that we would settle in that, that we would lean into the gospel truth and be sound in doctrine. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let us sing. What gift of grace, what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? For there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, no fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can see. I am free, and not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, with every breath, I long to 
follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only I hold my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Please remain standing as I give you this blessing from God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I want to thank you guys for joining us. Please stick around. Enjoy each other's company and fellowship. Pray for one another. Bless one another. And go in peace. God bless.